Daily Tech News Show is made possible by its listeners. Thanks to all of you, including DeGrasha A. Daniels, Erwin Stir, and Ken Hayes. Coming up on DTNS, is the metaverse open or less open? Plus, video games might help your mental health and all things retro gaming with Demetrius Janakis. This is the Daily Tech News for Wednesday, July 27th, 2022. From Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. In lovely Cleveland, Ohio, I'm Mitch Straffolino. In Salt Lake City, I'm Scott Johnson. I'm Roger Chang, the show's producer. Demetrius Janakis is also joining us, game developer and host of the Modern Vintage Gamer on YouTube. Demetrius, thank you so much for joining us. You are very welcome. It's great to be here. Well, we're so happy to have you. We're going to talk about gaming in a few minutes, but let's start with a few tech things you should know. Well, the rough quarter for tech earnings continues. Don't worry, Twitter and Snap, it wasn't just you. In Q2, Alphabet earned $1.21 per share on revenue, up 13% in the year to $69.69 billion, but both missed analyst estimates. Overall, ad revenue grew 12% in the year to $56.3 billion, its slowest since Q3 2020, while YouTube ad revenue grew just 5% in the year. Google Cloud revenue grew 35.6% to $6.27 billion, although the unit's operating loss increased 45% to $858 million. In more earnings news, in its Q4 earnings, Microsoft earned $2.23 per share, $2.23 per share on its slowest revenue growth since 2020. That's up 12% on the year to $51.87 billion, both missing analyst estimates. Its intelligent cloud unit, which includes Azure and Windows Server, grew revenue 20% on the year to $20.91 billion, with Azure revenue up 40%. That sounds good. More personal computing revenue increased 2% on the year to $14.36 billion. Within this, though, gaming revenue fell 7% on the year. In other earnings in its Q2, Spotify grew monthly active users 19% to 433 million, with paid users up 14% to 188 million, aka premium and paying users are up 14%. The company also announced it discontinued its car thing product, setting demand and supply chain issues, and it just not being for sale for most of its existence. And just people being like, why did what? you do this? You named That's it car very- thing, we don't get it. We don't, no one got, no one got it. And now they're discontinued. <laughs> All right. So moving off of earnings for a minute, Google added almost 100 photorealistic aerial views to landmarks in maps, Google maps. These new aerial views are a first step to launch the immersive view that the company showed off at Google IO earlier this year. The company also relaunched street view on maps with 10 cities in India. You might recall it suspended the service in the country in 2016 due to lack of security clearances from the government. Google partnered with local firms, Genesis International and Tech Mahindra for the relaunch and plans to expand to 50 cities by the end of the year. And Sony confirmed its upcoming PSVR 2 headset will include a see-through view mode to view your surroundings, a broadcast mode to record yourself while playing, and a cinematic mode to display non-VR games and content on a virtual screen. The broadcast mode does require a PS5 HD camera attached to your console. Still, though, no word on price or launch date, probably what everyone is kind of waiting for at this point. I'm actually kind of interested in the whole, you know, non-VR, you know, watch a movie on a plane type thing that I think they're going for here. Mm -hmm. All right. So let's talk about the metaverse. I know we've talked about it ad nauseum, but it keeps on ticking. The Federal Trade Commission filed for an injunction to block Meta from buying Meta, you know, formerly Facebook, from buying the virtual company, uh, virtual reality company within, which is the maker of VR game Supernatural, which I'm a big fan of and I've talked about quite a bit on the show in the past, possibly limiting Meta's push into the metaverse. It's an antitrust lawsuit and the first to be filed under Lena Khan, the current commission's chair. Now, The Verge reports that Meta CEO Mark Zuckerberg told employees in an all-hands meeting earlier this month that Meta is competing with Apple to determine what direction the internet should go in. Zuckerberg hopes Meta will be seen as the more open, cheaper alternative to Apple, 
Apple hasn't announced its VR or AR plans in any official capacity, but boy, there are a lot of rumors and it is expected to announce its first AR headset as soon as later this year. And Meta is participating in the Metaverse Open Standards Group, along with other tech giants like Microsoft, Epic Games, and others, to create open protocols that will let people easily move through future immersive 3D worlds with their virtual goods, working on standards like the equivalent of a JPEG in VR, uh, for example. Zuckerberg points out that Apple's approach to building uh, of building hardware and software it tightly controls works well for the iPhone, but that it's not really clear up front whether an open or closed ecosystem is going to be better when it comes to the metaverse. So you might be saying, well, okay, so Meta says it's pitted against Apple because Apple is closed and Meta is open. How is Meta going to make money? Like what is the, you know, what's, what's the long view here? As for how Meta's metaverse future looks from a revenue standpoint, Zuckerberg also said in the same meeting, our North Star is that can we get a billion people into the metaverse doing hundreds of dollars a piece in digital commerce by the end of the decade? If we do that, we'll build a business that is as big as our current ad business within the decade. So, all right, what do we think? Is meta like the Android to iOS when it comes to an open metaverse? Is that too much? Is is meta stretching here? You know, can meta convince users of that? It's a little it weird in terms of direction, isn't it? Like they, I like that comparison, except it's kind of backwards. Like normally what you do is Apple will do a thing and then somebody else like Android will come around and say, here's a viable, strong alternative. That's not what's happening here. And I think it's a little weird that, Meta doesn't want to try to lead. I mean, they say they do, but this feels like they're reacting to something we don't even know what it is yet. We don't know what they're doing. Plus, they up the price of, of the two year old piece of hardware they currently sell, or they will buy a hundred dollars. Buy a hundred dollars. It's not it's fifteen dollars. Like I was sort of shocked yesterday when we talked about that. Yeah, and For, it may just be that they're. I know you guys talked about this yesterday, but you know, kind of made me think like. Does Meta have a little insider info on what Apple yeah. is going to price their <laughs> their possibly. offering at, and yeah. and and know that they're still going to be undercutting Apple significantly to the point that they can raise a price a hundred dollars? Yeah, yeah, it's a really good point. But the bigger the bigger issue is until Apple announces something, we don't even know what their play is. I mean, their play will probably be focused more on. I don't know about more well, on AR. We just don't know. So they're well, kind of like well, they're going, we're just we're going to be ready no matter what. And well, I don't I don't know that they I don't know. I don't they're not instilling confidence in me. Let's put it well, on that note. We but here's what we do know. Like, here's what Apple has officially said. Right. They haven't like we, we've only heard reports from the information of Mark Gurman. And I mean, a lot of other sources, reputable sources that obviously this they're working on this air headset been working on it for a long time. We've seen comical renders of it. Um, but what we do know is that in January, Tim Cook responded specifically to questions about the metaverse on it earnings call saying that is very interesting to us but they really are keen on pivoting toward ar like they, they cook immediately pivoted to saying we've been investing in ar for years and that's going to be a continued area of investment for us um you know we've, we've all seen a, a lot of the ar apps and, and demos i mean going back i think to like the iphone 4 or something like that the the other thing that we've seen is mark german again in january in his newsletter basically saying Apple is not this first generation headset. They are really not looking at this in terms of like a metaverse long time wearing. Like you're not, they, they're not really seeing it as like watching a movie in your headset. It's going to be more uh, for, for short form stuff. And that basically like a metaverse kind of plate is off limits was the words uh, that German used on that. Matrice, what are your thoughts on this? Well, do, you have, uh, do you have thoughts on VR, AR, or what's ahead? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I've dabbled with VR before and... I wouldn't say that I'm I'm really kind of entrenched in that space, but I think it's interesting that Meta is saying they're an open platform when it's all tied to Facebook accounts, right? So it is, is it really an yes. open kind of standard? You know, you still have to have that connectivity or that that tie to your Facebook login. And I, I believe maybe they've relaxed that somewhat in recent times with with the new headsets, but I'd be I'd be very surprised if, you know, if it's really an open platform versus Apple. I mean, I, I get what they're trying to say. Well, I get what Zuckerberg is trying to say against with, with Apple because it is truly a closed ecosystem. But I don't know. I wouldn't say that, uh, that, that, that Meta is, is an open platform by any stretch. 
I mean, yeah, yeah the, the whole idea of meta saying, no, we want to work with, um, you know, other game developers to make sure that the metaverse is this open platform. It's like, we don't know what the metaverse is. Well, and, We and in talk terms about of, it a lot, but like, where is it? Where are we going? What are we doing? In terms of openness, I, I mean, I do think being part of that standards body, I do think it is important to have Facebook as the predominant, you know, seller of VR headsets, or at least kind of the consumer level. Like that is significant that they're on board for open metaverse standards. Now, whether that's to benefit themselves long-term, I'm sure that's the case. Why else would you do it? Um, but the idea that, they're going to be in a in a mixed hardware software standards world and and I think the counterpoint to that is we've seen this repeatedly it's like the ben, one of the benefits of Apple maybe playing within their own sandbox is they can have a, a, a fixed hardware platform that they're always betting against. That's what we've seen with being successful with iOS in a lot of ways. We've seen that they can uh, iterate a lot faster on some of these newer technologies. The, like the, the thing about standards is generally those iterate slow on purpose, right? Cause you don't want to break standards. Um, Apple, if, if, if they choose not to join that body, again, they're kind of playing by a, a totally different roadmap at this point. And if they're not even prepared to call it metaverse, I think this is uh, this is Meta, you know, forcing that comparison, saying we're the metaverse company, and Apple's like, we don't even want to use that word right now. Wow. Well, there are definitely yeah. some questions yet to be answered. Hopefully, by this fall, we'll have a lot more of those answers. Um, but moving on, for the purposes of the show, Scott, tell us about video games and mental health. Well, I have said for a long time that uh, that I felt like video games were good for me. I may have been wrong, but they're not bad for me either. Anyway, this is what's going on. In the past, when people asked how video games impacted your mental health, your answer was probably very much dependent on whether you like video games or not. Hence my story. Video games are a gigantic industry, but the academic research into mental health is still a work in progress. Previous studies have been limited uh, by having gamers self-report playing time, which isn't really all that accurate and can cause other issues. Yeah. Yeah. And in fact, last year, a team of social science researchers from the University of Oxford published a study in the a journal Royal Society Open Science, which worked with the EA, also Nintendo, to obtain records of player behavior for players opting into the study. So they said, yeah, we want to be part of this. The study only looked at two titles, Plants vs. Zombies, Battle for Neighborville, and Animal Crossing New Horizons, looking at about 3,200 players across two weeks. The researchers found a small positive relation between gameplay and effective well-being. Well, interesting. I kind of wish they'd have done more games, but in a new study in the same journal... <laughs> They expanded things. They expanded their scope and duration of the study. They recruited nearly 39,000 players. That is a lot. That's a big study sample. Over six weeks, game surveyed span a much wider range of genres. So this still included Animal Crossing again, but also Apex Legends. Get a shooter in there. Uh, EVE Online, big MMO. Forza, 4 Hori or Forza Horizon 4, a big driving game with a lot of stuff to do. Gran Turismo Sports, similar game. And The Crew 2, another driving game. They went really hard on the driving game. <laughs> uh, the researchers, again, use players' actual gaming data rather than self-reporting. Yeah, so players in the study were asked to scale their gaming experiences on a positive versus negative scale, ranking how often they felt things like happy or afraid, as well as something called the Cantrell Self-Anchoring Scale, which asks people to say whether they're on a ladder with the top being their best possible life. <laughs> oh boy, I've I'm somewhere in the middle of that these days. Player also took a player experience. Players also took a player experience of need satisfaction survey, which tracked experiences in specific titles, including motivations to play. So whether it's a shooter or an Animal Crossing game, you know, I I, th I feel like the sample size has gotten bigger. How's huh, Scott? For sure. In the end, this is where things get interesting. Study found that, quote, the impact of time spent playing video games on well-being is probably too small to be subjectively noticeable and not credibly different from zero, unquote. So again, negligible there at that end. How people felt in general also didn't impact sp uh, their time spent gaming. I can I can attune to that pretty well. <laughs> uh, the study did find some evidence that motivation to play did have a slightly larger impact on well-being, but it's not clear if it would have had a noticeable impact on individuals. Um, I still also think that they, as much as they expanded the study in the second phase, I really think they limited themselves by not really going for a more genre complete study. And it's a little tricky to do because it turns out there are 
a lot of video games. While we've been sitting here yeah. talking, 20 have been released on Steam probably. <laughs> Um, it's just yeah. the way the, the way we work today with video games, but I wouldn't mind like a resident evil in there or something that's a little scarier that'll, you know, get people's emotions going in a different direction and, and, uh, stick with the light stuff, the medium stuff, and then the harder stuff for lack of a better term. I think you may have had maybe more interesting, uh, oh, results. that's an interesting point. Jonas, do you have thoughts on whether or not, you know, a better variety of games would have, would have, uh, you know, tipped the scales a little bit here? Oh, I'm sorry. Was that was that for me? I'm sorry. Yes. Yeah. Sorry. Um, yeah. I mean, it's an interesting it's an interesting study, right? Because you're right. There's probably a lot of other games that could have been added. Like, I think of a game like Animal Crossing, which brought so much joy and happiness to people. You know, two years ago, in the middle of a pandemic, I think it was one of the reasons that game, in my opinion, became so successful. So, yeah, I think it would have definitely helped if additional genres was added into the mix and maybe just you know um widen the the spread of games a little bit i think it would have definitely helped yeah because at this stage it feels like it was helped it was funded by the automotive industry (laughs) well there's so many car games in there i don't don't know what they expected to get different differently out of those different experiences but i i do think it's interesting that they had a you know the initial study you could say animal crossing is very much a uh a not not even cooperative it's a it's a simulator you play and you invite others into it where and and plants for zombies tower defense you're playing it by yourself you're kind of playing against the game whereas you know uh, racing games yes you are very much it, it's very much uh, a lot of uh, and apex legends very much player versus player eve online is is all of that and more like it's this whole uh, uh, culture and and uh, economy and and everything like that. So I do feel like they did expand some to like more directly competitive in games where we might think there could be like hurt feelings in you know if if someone blows up your Eve Online chip you spent three years uh, provisioning out and stuff like that 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 is that is a lot different than necessarily maybe losing a game like Plants vs Zombies or something like that. So well, I, I do think that there yeah. are like they definitely did broaden the scope um, and and you know to kind of um, uh, to kind of counteract that. I mean, the important thing here is that we are getting more research, right? So that we can we can look at these and say, okay, how can we build even more studies? So you're right. Let's maybe do a, a first person shooter study. Let's let's get this into uh, you know World of Warcraft. Let's get them into more like like wide scale MMOs or older games that have more established communities. Although I think Eve Online falls into that, that as well. So right, yeah. you yeah. know that that is kind of the uh, what I think is it stands out to this is. Uh, we have the we're getting an increasing body of evidence now that other researchers can modify studies and look at. We can get more granular, as you guys are kind of saying, um, so that we can make informed policy as opposed to saying video games seem scary to me because I didn't play them growing up. So kids should shouldn't play them as much or something. like yeah. that. Yeah. And to, to stave off emails, uh, uh, the specific game they played here, Plants vs. Zombies Battle for Neighborville, is actually their third person competitive shooter. Uh, OK. So I think My in those bad. initial that initial My test, bad. they were like, here's a shooter where you're competitive and it's a little intense and here's your little management game. And there, you know, we'll get a good range between those two. I'm glad they expanded it. But um, yes, granularity, I think, is important in these kind of studies. This is a great step forward. Getting thirty nine thousand participants is huge. So it's I'm always happy to see. Yeah, more of this stuff is, is good stuff. I'm happy to happy to see it. Their bounce rates in that survey, though, were, were like we reached out to six hundred thousand people and two thousand Eve Online players responded to us. Yeah. Well, it might be uh, very likely that you're listening to this conversation and saying, "I have thoughts." If you are feeling social, get in touch with the DTNS audience on the social networks: DTNS Show on Twitter and DTNS Picks P I X on Instagram. Are a few couple ways you can get a hold with us and let us know how you feel. All right. Well, if you're into classic gaming or retro gaming, what, how, however you want to refer to it, you are definitely familiar with emulators. They've been around for forever. We've 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 all run DOS emulators, haven't we? The greatest of all time. Software that lets you emulate old game consoles, home computers, arcade machines to play games. But more recently, with the popularity of open source Mr. Project playing retro games, it's taken on new dimensions, kind of rethinking what we think a lot of uh, with uh, what we when we think of emulation. So, uh, Demetrius, can you uh, kind of explain what the the Mr. FPGA is, what this whole project is about? Yeah. Um, so you talked about emulation and in the past, you know, emulation, when we think about it, is it's a software thing. You know, so you uh, 
on your computer <clears throat> with a programming language you can build an emulator and it's all running via software and uh emulation is is pretty good these days uh, but there's always going to be that you know there's there's always going to be that edge case where something's not quite right or um there's some input delay that was not found in the original hardware so fpga is essentially taking the hardware schematics of a particular piece of hardware a target piece of hardware and for this example we'll just say um you know an arcade an arcade game and taking that schematic and just transforming it with a language known as hdl hardware definition language into um, a chip on the mister itself which is called the de10 nano so basically it's it's essentially uh, you know, simulating, replicating, emulating, whatever you want to call it, at a hardware level rather than a software level. So you're you're replicating the the entire schematics of a piece of hardware onto onto this Mister. So the end result of that is it's a lot more accurate um, than traditional software based emulation. There is things like um, you know input delay and, and and things like I said with with regular emulation is not existent in something like the mister and it's really being embraced by kind of the retro community right now because it's kind of that missing link between software emulation a lot of people a lot of people like software emulation a lot of people would rather have real hardware but real hardware is getting so expensive these days when we talk about retro gaming uh, if you want to go back you know and buy something that was out in the 80s or the 90s it's going to cost you a bit of money to get a good setup, right? So the Mister essentially just gives you in the palm of your hand, literally a, a really great hardware solution for you know old retro hardware. And a lot of people are really kind of embracing it, as I mentioned. So can you, I, I guess for when for retro gaming, so what are exactly, for people that haven't checked this out, like what what systems does this apply for and kind of how do you get set up for this? Are you plugging carts into this or, or what's happening with that? So there are many, many different systems that run on the Mister. I didn't I haven't taken account, but there is um, at least a few hundred, I would say. So all the um, well, not all, but the majority of home computers that you probably have heard of, like the Commodore 64, Apple to the uh, the Macintosh, the Amiga, the Atari ST, uh, you know DOS uh, as well, I, I, IBM PCs um, are all you know handled by the Mister. Uh, eight 16-bit and some 32-bit consoles like the um, Super NES Genesis, even the PlayStation and the Sega Saturn's getting getting some support now are all supported. Things like Game Boy, Game Boy Advance. Uh, and arcade. So there's a lot of different arcade games that run on the Mister. So the support for it is is growing, and there is a active community that's continuing to add pretty much every single day, add new cores to the Mister project. And everything is free and open source. It's all based on the community. Um, so there's a lot of involvement, a lot of kind of iterating that's going on, and there's a lot of day to day kind of updates that happen. And it's it's actually it's it's quite good. And so, as far as your second question, do you plug cartridges into it? No, you don't. Basically, it's you kind of treat it the same way you would treat a traditional emulator. You kind of um, load it all, you know, load up everything on an SD card, put all your ROMs on there, and kind of the the start and finish result doesn't seem any different than traditional emulation. But you're running it on this small, you know, uh, Mister DE10 Nano board, and it essentially just manages the whole thing for you. And the great thing about this device is you can connect it up to an old school CRT or a, a flat panel HD TV, or you can even connect it up to an arcade uh, machine. So you can basically have the Mister replacing kind of traditional arcade boards at great levels of accuracy. So it's a it's kind of a, a solution for many, many different people to do many different things with. I, I have my own in my house and I just have mine connected up to my um, big television in the living room. When I want to get my retro fix on, that's that's kind of what I use. So it's uh, it's it's very versatile and uh, it's it's a very awesome you know piece of hardware. 
It's interesting because a lot of folks who maybe do retro via other methods, whether they buy a new mini console from Nintendo, which, by the way, is just software emulation. It's not an actual Nintendo Super Nintendo in there. Right. Um, that's true kind of across the board of all those devices, but they're pretty good. And you plug them in and you play them and you go, this is great. I enjoy this. Or you buy a compilation on Steam of a bunch of old Neo Geo games and they look great on your computer and you're playing great. And they're even maybe widescreen. They've added some bells and whistles that that recent uh, Pac-Man collection, 40 year Pac-Man collection is a bit like that. But what the, what the, the special sauce here explained very well by Dimitri's is that this thing will, it's virtual still, but it's, it's like an exact circuit repli replication of say a Genesis or mega drive. If you were in Europe or Japan, and when you play your games, those ROMs on that in, in that environment, gone are any differences. <clears throat> the differences are virtually not there. The only real difference is it doesn't look like a Genesis and that there's no cartridges stick in the top and you didn't plug in, uh, you know, perhaps to the same TV you had in 1994, but, but for all effects and purposes, it is the real deal. Again, most people, they may run some emulation on their PC or Mac and go, this is fine. What's the problem? And for most people, that's still going to be true. Um, but this just represents an amazing step forward, but not just in games emulation. I think that FP, FPGA has huge potential as a scalable technology to create virtual environments that are so exacting that everything from replicating what a supercomputer did precisely back in 1974 uh, is possible here. It's just going to be a matter of somebody, you know, doing the work to get it done. And I think it's amazing. It's really yeah, cool and, stuff. And just to add to that real quick, you know, we talk about retro gaming, but what Mr. Really brings to the table as well is kind of hardware preservation. You know, we talk about software preservation, preserving games and making sure that these games are available. Um, so, you know, future generations can play, you know, games. Well, this is essentially doing the same thing on but on a hardware level the people that are actually taking hardware schematics and then you know putting them into the mister those things are preserved forever so you can always go back and recreate that hardware which is i think a really cool thing and we've got some links to this in the show notes uh demetrius but where should people go if they want to like kind of check this out and and see how to get started with all this uh i would suggest um so i did a good video on the mister so check out my channel um modern vintage gamer if uh, if you want kind of a, a quick introduction on the mister and, and how I kind of fared with it. But I would say if you're looking for a, um, you know, more detailed setup guides and information, I would check out uh, a good friend of mine, uh, Bob, his name is retro RGB. So I would go to his, his website. I think it's retro retro RGB.com. He has got a ton of Mr. Information on there. He, he basically covers it every single week on, oh, wow. on his webpage. So um, I would, I would suggest check that out. He's got setup guides and all sorts of things on there. So check out his channel. Excellent. Well, if you're uh, a person who wants to do some travel and you need a guide of your own, here um, there's some vacation time that you might have set up, but you might not know where to go and what makes the most sense. Chris Christensen, our amateur traveler, has some thoughts. This is Chris Christensen from Amateur Traveler with another Tech in Travel Minute. One of the first tools that I ever reviewed as I started the Amateur Traveler blog and podcast about 17 years ago was Kayak Explore, kayak.com slash explore. It had a different name at the time, but it lets you say, I can go anywhere in the world. Where can I go and how much will it cost in September? How much will it cost in October? Well, they've made a new change to that tool, which I have still used for these last 17 years that lets you say, I can leave on this date and come back on this date. Now, where can I go and give me a better idea what the cost will be for airfare? And it's quite useful for me right now because I'm thinking about going and working remotely for a week and I know what dates I want to do it. And this is the kind of tool that helps with that. That's kayak.com slash explore. And I'm Chris Christensen from Amateur Traveler. Thank you, Chris. As always, always good stuff. Also, thanks to Demetrius Janakis. And I'm sorry, I called you Gianni earlier. It's just oh, my okay. favorite Milwaukee Bucks <laughs> basketball <good>. player. <laughs> um, let folks know where they can keep up with everything that you do. Yeah, you can find me on YouTube. Uh, just Google Modern Vintage Gamer and I'll, I'll be there. And um, if you want to kind of be more interactive with me, I'm on Twitter as well at Modern Vintage G. So check out uh, my Twitter throw me a follow my dms are open um so you know you know feel free to ask me any questions there too you heard the man 
Get in those DMs. Uh, Scott Johnson, always nice to have you as well. Let folks know what you are up to lately. Sure. Uh, well, as always, over on the Frog Pants Network, there's tons of podcasts to listen to. And in particular, I uh, would like to point people toward Core. I also do a retro show, but I'm before I uh, uh, get back into that, there's Thursday coming. And Thursday means Core. Core is a show all about modern gaming. It's all about what's happening in the inter- industry, uh, in games in general, the games we're playing, and how they might impact you. Uh, I'm told it's really good. So check it out and see what you think on Thursday nights. Uh, that's over at frogpants.com slash core, or just search for core wherever you get your podcasts. Excellent. We also have a brand new boss to thank. The brand new boss, his name is Martin. Martin just started backing us on Patreon. Thank you, Martin. Thank you, Martin. Yay, yay, yay. There's a longer version of the show called Good Day Internet available at patreon.com slash DTNS. If you know, you know. But if you don't, a lot of fun. We're live Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern. That's 2000 UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We're back tomorrow doing it all again with Amar Wilson joining us. Talk to you soon. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. (laughs)